All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Our uh, sermon text today is Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We have it here on the screen, but uh, if you want a paper Bible, we also have those at the back if you didn't bring one, and you're more than welcome to keep it. That's our, our gift to you. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. What then can we say that Abraham, our physical ancestor, has found? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to brag about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now to the one who works, pay is not considered as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who declares the ungodly to be righteous, his faith is credited for righteousness. Likewise, David also speaks of the blessing of the man God credits righteousness to apart from works. How joyful are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. How joyful is the man the Lord will never charge with sin. Is this blessing only for the circumcised then, or is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness. In what way then was it credited, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while he was circumcised, but uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while still uncircumcised. This was to make him the father of all who believe but are not circumcised so that righteousness may be credited to them also. And he became the father of the circumcised who are not only circumcised but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. If those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made empty and the promise is cancelled. For the law produces wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace, to guarantee it to all the descendants. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. He is the father of us all in God's sight. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He believed in God who gives life to the dead and call things into existence that do not yet exist. He believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations according to what had been spoken. So will your descendants be. He considered his own body to be already dead since he was about a hundred years old and also considered the deadness of Sarah's womb without weakening in the faith. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Therefore it was credited to him for righteousness. Now it was not credited now it was credited to him was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us. It will be credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Let's pray. God, I pray that um, you would speak to us now through this text, this text read, this text taught. May your voice be clear. May your truth, your reality be clear. And may we know what to do to take our next step with you. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last Friday on Good Friday, we talked about the good news. Uh, the last part of Romans chapter 3, uh, Paul, ha- Paul has just spent several chapters and verses talking about all of the bad news, and then he's finally given us the good news, which is that salvation is by faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, because of God's grace alone. Uh, to live forever with God, we need to be righteous. That is, our actions, our thoughts, our words, they, they need to be perfectly aligned with the will and the heart of God. We, we need to have a right standing with God because we have a right record before God. But the bad news is that none of us can do that. We've all fallen short of that. We've all fallen short of righteousness and who we were made to be. And we can't make ourselves righteous before God. And God, in his holy justice, has to punish us. But because of Jesus, there's deliverance. 
Because of Jesus, there is rescue from what we deserve. And God can declare us righteous. He can justify us while remaining just himself. He can righteous us while remaining righteous himself. He is able to forgive and reinstate us to full standing as sons and daughters, even though we are wicked, even though we do not deserve it because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, Yahweh is able to be who he declares himself to be, the God who will not leave the guilty unpunished, but who is also a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love, maintaining love to a thousand generations, forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin. And Jesus enables God to do all of this by being our substitute, by taking what we deserve in our place and giving us what we do not deserve in place of that. If you're not quite following me so far, that's okay because all of this is going to get elaborated on in this chapter as well. So salvation, salvation, Paul is emphatic, is not about our performance. It isn't about us measuring up. It isn't about us being enough and doing enough. It isn't about our religiosity and our moral superiority to everybody else. Salvation is about faith, trust, belief. Now some might wonder, in Paul's audience as Romans is being read, well, if salvation can't be achieved by works, then why was the law ever given to Moses? What was the point of the law? And why would God make people think that they could save themselves by works only to reveal to them later that actually you never could? These are important questions. And Paul gets to that in this chapter. And his answer probably surprised his Jewish audience, his law-possessing audience. He essentially argues that it was actually never about works. It's never been about works. It has always been about faith. Salvation has always been by faith. And Paul goes all the way back to the very start of Israel's history. He goes right back to Abraham and he says, how was Abraham justified? How was Abraham made right before God? Abraham didn't have the law. (laughs) Israel hadn't received the law yet. The law wouldn't be revealed for another 430 years. And yet God justified Abraham. How? Paul says, or quotes in verse 3, What does the scripture say? Abraham believed, and it was credited to him for righteousness. This quote, this statement comes out of Genesis 15. Back in Genesis, we read that out of the mass of humanity... God chose Abraham and through him a nation to be his people. And God came to Abraham and he promised him this. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Because I'm going to give you a nation. And that nation is going to be my people And I'm going to be their God. And I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you a place where you're going to be able to dwell with me. This is the promise that he gives Abraham. Here's the thing. At the time that Abraham gets this promise from God, he has no children. He has no heirs. And his wife is unable to conceive. And they are both well beyond childbearing years. This is what it means later in Romans 4. When it says Abraham considered his own body to be already dead since he was about 100 years old, dramatic language, and also considered the deadness of Sarah's womb. They weren't able to have kids, and they didn't have any kids. And God promises a miracle. He promises a son. And not only would Abraham have a son, but that son would have children who would have children who would have children who would have children until Abraham's descendants would be more numerous than the stars in the heavens. It is a bold, ambitious, not possible without miraculous, supernatural intervention promise. And we're told that Abraham believed. He took God at his word, And he trusted him. And this act of faith, this act of belief and trust, it says, was credited to him as righteousness. 
he was given a right record before God and therefore a right standing with God. The word translated credited is used here for the first time, and it's used five times in six verses. When used in a financial or commercial context, it signifies to put something to somebody's account. Now, there's two ways that that can occur, right? Either you are paid for your labors, or you receive a gift. If paid, then you earned it. You did the work for it. You are only getting what you are owed, what you deserve. It is your right. It's given to you out of contractual obligation. But if gifted to you, then you did not work for it. It is an act of unearned generosity towards you. Paul says in verse 4, Now to the one who works, pay is not considered as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who declares the ungodly to be righteous... His faith is credited for righteousness. The the crediting of righteousness, of a right record and a right standing, that was credited to Abraham's account. It wasn't the result of a contractual obligation between Abraham and God. There was no law yet. Abraham did nothing to earn it. Abraham did nothing to deserve it. It was not his right. God credited Abraham's faith as righteousness out of sheer grace. Out of sheer grace, it was an unearned act of generosity. It was a gift. Now, the rabbis of Paul's day taught that Abraham's faith was his faithfulness. And he was declared righteous by God because he was righteous. I.e., God declared him good because he was, in and of himself, good. He did everything necessary for God to stamp him with approval and call him good. And Paul emphatically argues here, where is that in the text? Rabbis, where is that in the text? It says specifically that his faith, not his faithfulness or his righteousness, was credited as righteousness. It was his belief. John Stott says, if anything is clear in the antithesis between verse 4 and 5, it is that the crediting of faith as righteousness is a free gift, not an earned wage, and that it happens not to those who work, but to those who trust, and indeed who trust the God who, far from justifying people because they are godly, actually justifies them when they are ungodly. Paul then moves on to David. It's interesting that Paul is building his argument using two of the most important figures uh, in Jewish history, Abraham, the patriarch of the nation, and David, one of the nation's greatest kings. Verse 6 Likewise, David also speaks of the blessing of the man God credits righteousness to apart from works. How joyful are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. How joyful is the man the Lord will never charge with sin. This quote of David's comes right out of Psalm 32. And we don't know exactly when this psalm was written. We don't know the occasion upon which this psalm was written. We don't know what prompted it. But what we certainly do know from the story of David's life is that he was a sinner. Uh, He was not somebody who deserved the love of God. He actually committed some very heinous sins in his lifetime. And yet here he says, Joyful is the one whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. New Testament commentator G. Campbell Morgan says, It's a psalm of penitence, but it is also the song of a ransomed soul rejoicing in the wonders of the grace of God. David in this psalm is praising God for the beautiful reality that righteousness, a right standing with God because of a right record before God, it is not earned. Because if it is earned, then there's no hope for any of us. If it's earned, there's absolutely no hope for King David. King David falls wildly short of God's standard of righteousness. If he's got to earn his way to heaven, he's never ever going to get there. And the same is true for all of us. But David rejoices in this psalm. It isn't earned. It isn't worked for. God credits righteousness to people apart from their works. It is not based on us, on our performance. It's an act of sheer grace. And the question might be, well, if our righteousness, or sorry, if righteousness is credited to us, what becomes then of our sins? 
what happens to those. And David says here, they're not credited to us, but rather they're forgiven. Our sins are covered. We are not charged with our sins. So what is not credited to our account is what deserves to be credited to our account. And what is credited to our account is what does not deserve to be credited to our account. Our sins deserve to be seen, but they get covered and forgiven and in their place, righteousness. Stop points out here that the word translated credited can also be translated imputed. The imagery of counting and crediting is financial, but that of imputation is legal. Both mean to reckon something as belonging to someone, but in the former cases, this is money. In the latter sense, it's innocence or guilt. In other words, blessed is the man who is given or imputed, again, not because of their works, but apart from their works, a record of innocence. Blessed is the person who is declared innocent, even though they are guilty. And the obvious question is, how is this possible? How can guilty people be declared innocent and God still remain just? How is this possible? And that's what we looked at last week. It's possible in Jesus. What occurred at the cross was what we call, theologians call, double imputation. My sins were credited to Jesus' account. And the debt that needs to be paid was paid by Jesus on the cross in my place as my substitute. And then his righteousness, his record of a perfect life, was then imputed to me. My sin goes to Jesus, and he gets treated the way that I deserve to be treated, and Jesus' righteousness goes to me, and I get to be treated the way that Jesus deserved to be treated. It's double imputation, or as Martin, Martin Luther calls it, the great exchange. Now, it's important to note, imputation is not the same as infusion. We are not infused with righteousness by faith. So that we actually become righteous in the moment that we give ourselves to Jesus. That's an entirely different process. That's what theologians call sanctification. That's our becoming like and living like Jesus in the world. And that's a lifelong journey. As we like to say at Southeast City Church... It is a messy journey with two steps forward and five steps back and five steps forward and two steps back and it's all over the place and there are seasons of victories and seasons of disappointments and struggle. It's a mess. It's lifelong and it's not completed until Jesus' return. That's sanctification where we're becoming actually righteous but rather by faith we're not infused with righteousness but righteousness is imputed to us. We're not actually innocent, but we're reckoned as innocent, and we're treated positionally, legally, as if we were innocent. So without actually being righteous, we all get the benefits of being righteous. That's justification, right? Counted as innocent, and then I'm sanctified. Paul has made some astounding statements here. David, who was king... In Israel's heyday, with the law, priesthood, sacrifices, feast festivals, was righteous before God apart from his works. And then Abraham was righteous before God before there ever was a law or tabernacle or temple or priesthood or sacrifices or day of atonement or circumcision. In verse 9, Paul says, Is this blessing of imputed righteousness only for the circumcised then, or is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness. In what way then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while he was circumcised, but uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while still uncircumcised. I I didn't know that I was going to be saying the word circumcision so many times today. But that's scripture. (laughs) So what is going on here? What's Paul talking about? Well, some in Paul's day argued that Abraham was justified, made right with God, because he obeyed and circumcised himself and his household. It was because of his obedience that he was justified. But Paul again asks, where is that in the text? See, Paul is all about the text and all about context. This is good stuff. We need to learn from Paul here. Where is that in the text? 
It says, Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness in Genesis 15, and then circumcision doesn't come on the scene until Genesis 17. So it couldn't have been because of circumcision that he was justified before God. He was justified by his faith, and circumcision came later. And Paul makes it clear that he was circumcised, not to become righteous, but as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. You see, for the Jewish people, circumcision was meant to be an outward marker of a reality that already existed apart from the marker. Abraham was a child of God, and so was marked as a child of God, but that mark didn't make him a child of God. He was a child of God and therefore was marked. A more relatable and correlated example would be baptism. Right? Christians publicly declare their allegiance to Jesus by being baptized, but it is an outward act that dramatizes what has already taken place in their lives. They've already entrusted themselves to Jesus and therefore have gone from death to life. They were spiritually dead to God and now they are alive in God because of Jesus. They've been adopted into God's family. That took place the minute they had faith and now they dramatize it and declare it publicly by being baptized. So baptism is a public display of an already existing reality. And John Stott warns that we must get the order right and not confuse the sign with the the thing signified. You are baptized because you are saved. You are not baptized to be saved. Just as Abraham was circumcised, marked as a child of God, because he already was a child of God by faith. And then in verse 11 or the latter part of verse 11, Paul says, this was to make him the father of all who believe, but are not circumcised, so that righteousness may be credited to them also. And he became the father of the circumcised, who are not only circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. That Abraham was justified by faith, Paul is arguing here, and not by circumcision, makes him the father of all who, like him, have faith and believe God, whether they're circumcised or not. More specifically, those who believe that Jesus Christ has done everything necessary to make them right with God. He has taken our sins, died for our sins, and gifted us his righteousness. Paul is saying here that Abraham, then, is not just a patriarch for the Jewish people only, but he's also a patriarch for the Gentiles. Therefore, all true Jews, that is, those who are truly descendants of Abraham because of faith, or sorry, all true Jews then are those who are truly descendants of Abraham because of their faith, whether they are circumcised or not, Jewish or not. And therefore, all of the promises that were made to Abraham belong to those who have faith whether circumcised or not, or Jewish or not. Again, John Stott, he says, although according to the Jews, Abraham was the great dividing point in the history of mankind, according to Paul, Abraham through faith became the great rallying point for all who believe. For where circumcision divides, faith unites. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 13, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants, that he would inherit the world, was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. If those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made empty and the promise is cancelled. For the law produces wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. So Paul further builds his argument about salvation by faith by stating that God's promise to Abraham It didn't come by works, and it didn't come by the law, and it didn't come by circumcision. As we saw in Genesis, God chose Abraham out of the mass of humanity and promised that he would make him a great nation 
and that through that nation all of the nations of the earth would be blessed and they would be his people and he would be their God and they would live with him in the land that he gave them. That was the promise. That promise was given, as we see in Genesis, without any requirements, any conditions. Nothing was attached to it. God's word came to Abraham as a gratuitous promise and not as law. And Abraham simply believed and was justified, declared righteous. It's interesting. You almost miss it if you read it too quickly. It's interesting that Paul says that the promise to Abraham was that he would inherit the world. Because if you go back to Genesis, that's not actually what it says there. The promise is that he would inherit Canaan. A specific plot of land with delineated borders. <laughs> but God's promise of land, of a place where he and his people would be able to dwell together in shalom, that was never meant to be restricted to just Canaan. It might have started there, but it was never meant to remain there. Not if God's plan was eventually to adopt people from all ethnicities on the face of the earth, which is his plan. And if Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to bless the nations through Abraham, which he is, then Jesus is not the king of a strip of land in Palestine. He is the king of the world. And his dominion is universal. And when he returns to vanquish all evil and establish his kingdom, the earth, we're told, will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Abraham's spiritual descendants then, those who like him have faith in God, believe in God, believe in Jesus. Abraham's spiritual descendants, Christians, the church, we inherit the earth. We don't inherit Texas. We don't inherit Alberta. <laughs> we don't inherit Israel. We inherit the earth. And Paul says this promise that was given to Abraham, it was given unconditionally. The promise then can't be said to be tied to rituals like circumcision or to the law. If it's earned, if it's earned through law keeping and it's earned through markers, then it was not a promise. Paul says faith is made empty and the promise is canceled. There's no hope <laughs> If this promise of blessing and I will be your God and you will be my people and we will dwell together in shalom on the earth, if that promise is, a, is in any way, shape, or form attached to or conditioned upon me performing, showing up, doing, being enough, then there's no hope of ever getting it. The only thing that law gets us, Paul says, is wrath. That's all that it produces. We cannot make ourselves righteous by keeping the law. We will fail over and over again. And the more we break the law, the angrier God becomes. Not because he is anger or he is wrath, but because he is holy and cannot abide our evil and must punish the wicked. If the promise is attached to the law, then we're sunk. But if the promise was made apart from the law, then there is no transgression there is no violating or breaking of the law that can annul that promise. It can be ours by faith, regardless of our performance in this life. We can be God's children and dwell with him through ever, forever and inherit the earth through the imputed righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus, not by trying our hand at our own righteousness. And then Paul says in verse 16, this is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace, to guarantee it to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. He is the father of us all in God's sight. The promises given to Abraham have nothing to do with ethnicity, rituals, markers, religiosity, rule keeping, moral superiority. They are purposefully detached from these things because, number one, there is no hope if you have to earn it, and number two, so that it can be for everybody, for everybody who believes. 
We don't deserve them, but we don't need to deserve them. They are, as Paul says, received by faith according to grace. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He, Abraham, believed in God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. Abraham trusted that God is God, that God is able to do the impossible, that God is able to resurrect the dead, that God is able to create something out of nothing. This, this faith was evidenced when, in a particularly jarring story that I don't have time to unpack in a way that maybe it deserves to be unpacked, but this is evidenced by a story in the Old Testament where Abraham is actually willing to sacrifice Isaac to God. Right? He was willing to sacrifice Isaac, the promised son, the one through whom his nation would come and the nations would be blessed. He was willing to sacrifice him to God. But in Hebrews 11, it says that he reasoned that God could even raise the dead. He's like, if God is asking me to sacrifice my son, it must be because he wants to perform the miracle of when my son is dead, of raising him back from the dead, because he promised me this son, promised me a nation, and he's able to resurrect the dead, right? Abraham's faith in who God is was evidenced by his actions. Paul says in verse 18, he believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what had been spoken. So will your descendants be. He considered his own body to be already dead since he was about 100 years old, and also considered the deadness of Sarah's womb without weakening in the faith. Abraham knew with humanity this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The God who can resurrect the dead and create something out of nothing, surely he can cause an elderly, barren couple to become pregnant. Verse 20, he did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Abraham believed if God promised it, he will do it. God is God, and not only can he do the impossible, he is trustworthy, and he cannot lie. Therefore, it was credited to him for righteousness. His faith reckoned him righteous. There are two kind of side things that I want us to see in this text quickly before we move on to the last few verses. Number one, Abraham's faith propelled him to obey God. He believed God, and so he obeyed God. This is important. In Scripture, faith is not mere intellectual assent. I agree with this intellectually, theoretically, in my head. That's not what faith, belief, and trust is in Scripture. Faith is trusting in someone or something in such a way that it changes your life. It changes the trajectory of your life. It changes how you act. It changes how you live. That's what faith is in Scripture. It isn't just accepting propositional truths, check, check, check. It's believing in God in such a way that it actually transforms your life. This is why James, in you could almost say a counterbalance to Paul, this is why James says faith without works is dead. Right? We're not saved by our works, but our works authenticate the genuineness of our faith. Our works show that we actually truly believe. That's the first thing I want us to notice. The second thing I want us to notice in these verses is that Paul says Abraham did not waver in unbelief at God's promise. And I've always wrestled with that. Because, man, if you go back to Genesis, it's like, ah. I feel like Abraham wavered a couple of times. <laughs> and he, he had some moments there. He had moments where he questioned God. I still don't have a son. Where the sun at? That was weird. I don't know why I said it that way. <laughs> he questioned God. He tried to fulfill God's promises on his own. Oh, God must want me to sleep with my servants and <laughs> bring things about that way. Not quite, Abraham. Nice try. He almost sabotaged the whole thing on several occasions, right? It, 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 it seems to me like Abraham wavered sometimes. Now, his faith was not always of a high quality. But even though he doubted, questioned, worried, misinterpreted, misunderstood 
try to wrestle back control from God sometimes and make things happen apart from God, he never ultimately stopped believing in the promise. And God looks at that and God says that is unwavering faith. I don't know about you, but I take tremendous hope in that, right? It's not about the quality of your faith, it's about the object of your faith. And then in verse 23, Paul says this, Now it was credited to him, was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us. It will be credited to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Paul says here that Abraham's faith righteous him, that Abraham received by grace a right record and therefore a right standing, that wasn't just written down in Genesis as a neat anecdote about Abraham's life for people to look at and say, isn't it neat that that happened to Abraham? No, it's, it's no coincidence that it's there. It wasn't just written for Abraham, it's written for us. Paul says God was preaching the gospel of salvation by faith, preaching the gospel of grace hundreds of years before the law ever came on the scene and hundreds of years before Jesus ever came on the scene. God wanted everyone to know that salvation has never been by works. It has always ever only been by faith. It has always been about faith. Just as Abraham had righteousness imputed to his account by faith, we can have righteousness imputed to us. And not just anybody's righteousness, but the righteousness of the sinless, unblemished, blameless, holy Son of God, Jesus Christ in the flesh. His righteousness can be imputed to us so that we can be right before God and therefore have a right standing with God if, if like Abraham, we believe, if we have faith, if we trust, if we believe that we are sinners, that we have indeed fallen short of who we are meant to be and who God created us to be. And as a result, we've hurt ourselves and hurt others and hurt the creation and grieved God. If we believe that we're sinners, if we believe that we are lost and helpless and hopeless, there's nothing that we can do to make ourselves right before God. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves righteous before a holy God if we believe that. But if we also believe that nevertheless God loves us, even though we are broken and fallen and flawed and messed up, God looks at us with compassion and God loves us. If we believe that God loves us and if we believe that God sent Jesus to die for our sins, that is to be our substitute, to take our sin on himself and be punished in our place and then gift us his righteousness so that we can be rescued and delivered and forgiven. He was delivered up for our trespasses, Paul says. And if we believe that God raised Jesus our Lord from the dead as a public declaration that his sacrifice is accepted. As Paul says here, he was raised for our justification. And Jesus has overcome hell, death, Satan, demons, our sin, and has removed every barrier between us and God. And in him is forgiveness. In him is new life. In him is life forever with God. If we have faith and we believe all of that, to summarize it, that Jesus, even though we didn't deserve it, Jesus has done everything necessary through his sinless life, his substitutionary death, and his bodily resurrection from the dead to make us right with God. If we believe that, then our sins are credited to Jesus on the cross. They're covered, they're taken away, they're dealt with, and Jesus' righteousness becomes ours. And even though we are not innocent, positionally we are reckoned as innocent and we are treated as righteous. And then the Spirit of God invades our lives and starts to actually make us practically righteous. Sanctification until the day when Jesus returns and makes us actually righteous. Glorification. This is the gospel. Believe in Jesus. And you are reckoned as innocent 
and reconciled to God. And then God will start a perfect work in you of making you new. And someday you will be new and all things will be new. And you will live with God for forever. Not because of anything you've done, but because of Jesus. That's the gospel. Thank you, James. That is allowed. <laughs> Amen. All right. My last point. I was like, oh, I can end there. That's a good place to end. But something else occurred to me. We live in a culture right now where increasingly you have to perform to be accepted. Now, you're not measuring up to any kind of biblical standard of righteousness. You're, you're having to measure up to a morality of a secular religion. But increasingly, you have to believe the right things, say the right things, do the right things. You have to, to measure up to be accepted in our society. Well, how do you know if you're measuring up? Well, you're praised by the right people. And so you become a slave to everybody else's opinion of you. You become a slave to what is so-and-so thinking and what is so-and-so saying. And so you're always putting stuff out there to make sure everybody knows that you're good. You're good. You're believing the right things. You need likes. You need retweets. You need views. You need affirmation. And as long as you're doing well, everything's okay. You're a little nerve-wracked, but everything's okay as long as you're doing well. But one mistake, as we've seen, can end it all. And that mistake can be a tweet from 20 years ago. <laughs> one mistake can end it all, and you might never bounce back. And if you do, it's because you spent a long time having to earn and earn and earn to get back into everybody's good graces. It's interesting. I often hear it quoted, to err is human, but it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of room to err these days. <laughs> doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of grace for humanity in our culture. And this is no way to live. It's no way to live. A slave to everybody's opinions, nervous that at any moment you might be found out for the flawed human being that you are and then it's all over. It's no way to live. And it's exhausting and it's crushing and it leads to an awful lot of hypocrisy. <laughs> right? To saying certain things, not because you actually believe them, but because you want everybody to see you a certain way. The Pharisees did this in Jesus' day. Christian conservatives and fundamentalists have done it throughout the ages. And, and now, in our culture, secularists are doing the very same thing. And while we treat each other this way, thank God what we see in Romans is that God doesn't treat us this way. With God, it isn't about your performance. With God, it's about Jesus. And with God, there is forgiveness and grace and endless second chances and mercy. And it's because of Jesus. That is, in every day and age, good news. But it's certainly good news in our day and age. At this time, we're going to take communion together. If you're a follower of Jesus, you can join us. Uh, in this, you can get your elements at the back if you need to, if you didn't get those on the way in. And really today, uh, I'd like to give us a chance to reflect before we take communion. And today, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I just want to hold out this good news to you. I just want to hold out this gospel to you. If you are not a follower of Jesus, guess what? If you are not right with God, you can be made right with God right here today. You don't have to keep coming back week after week after week and take communion and maybe get baptized and serve and volunteer and give. And if I do all of these good things, maybe God will accept me. No, you can be made right with God. You can be cleansed and forgiven and made new and brought into an eternal relationship, love relationship with God right now. It can happen in this moment because it's not based on you. It's based on Jesus. And Jesus says, come to me. Come to me if you're weary and burdened and I'll give you rest. I'll save you. I'll reconcile you to God. I'll cleanse you. I'll do it. I've already done it and I can apply it to you. Just give your life to me. Trust me. Have faith in me. 
You can be forgiven and made new through Jesus today. And I just, I want to hold that out to you and pray that you would accept Jesus. And for those of us that already are followers of Jesus, we have a lot to thank Jesus for. I hope we feel that in the depths of our hearts today after everything we've been through. I hope we're like, wow, I've got a lot to thank Jesus for. And I just want to give you a moment to thank Jesus for all the things that you need to thank Jesus for. And also to take a moment and ask Jesus, Jesus, I want my faith to not just be intellectual assent. Maybe for some of you that's what it is. Maybe today you need to be like, I want my faith to be a belief and a trust in you that actually changes and transforms how I live in the world. That needs to be what you need to pray. I'm going to give you a moment to pray that, and then I'll pray, and we'll take communion together. So let's take a moment of quiet together.